Good afternoon. This is Dwayne Alexander Miller in Madrid, and I'm very happy to be talking with someone that I met in person many years ago. We were just talking about this before starting the recording at a conference, I think, back in the, the mid-2000s, and uh, he and I have stayed in touch uh, sporadically over the years. I know that I cited a number of your works in my own doctoral dissertation some time ago, but tell us who you are and, and what you're interested in, and, and uh and then we'll get to your fascinating new project. Yeah, my name is Roy Oxnavad. I live in the Chicago area and I have been working with uh, people from a Muslim background for oh, since 1985. And I have done that overseas in Brussels, Belgium, and I have been doing it here in the United States also. Um, for 20 years had been with the Billy Graham Center out of Wheaton College, um, where I helped start, where well, I started the uh, Kama, a coalition of ministries to Muslims in North America. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of uh, who I am and what I've been up to. The, um, one of the things that I've run across is the sense of uh, people are coming from a background who, that have very little knowledge of what Christianity is, uh, very little contact with Christians uh, in their growing up because of uh, the places where they live. Uh, when they come to know Christ, <clears throat> there is a huge sort of learning gap that needs to be filled in. And uh, so out of this, I've been working on uh, just sort of writing some material that would help them. Um, and it's sort of going back to some of the early church fathers and asking and writing and seeing what they had written around about, such as Gregory the Great, uh, who had the seven deadly sins, out of which uh, he had gotten that from Evagoras of Pontus, who had the eight daily, deadly thoughts. And I've come up with something that I call reconstructing the Christian life, which is uh, to do one better, uh, nine vices and nine virtues. <laughs> and, I, I, love uh, that. I, like I love that a lot. Um, and, and I think this is something that is on the radar a lot of, of, of a lot of people who are working with Muslims and believers who came from Islam. Um, the fact that the sort of modern model that we were given, which is basically if you get information into people's heads, that that will somehow result in a, in a holy and healthy life. And I think that comes out of the enlightenment. And I think we're really running up to the limitations of, of that model. You know, like I, I remember when I was a, a teenager, I did a course, it was like 14 courses on the Christian life. And it was like, well, you did that, you, you've been discipled, um, you know? So I, I love what you're doing here, going back to the early church and uh, myself and, and other people, you know, we're trying to recover some Semitic medieval patristic elements so I, I, I love what you're doing. Tell us more about that and uh, the, the nine, the nine practices that, uh, that you have. Yeah, and one of the things that I, sort of going back to sort of Avakris's goal, which was to know and love God. So he asked the question, what prevents us from knowing God? And uh, so much of what prevents us from knowing God is our culture and where we've been raised. And uh, culture is made up of people who are sort of coming together, have the same habits, the same likes, the, the same um, ways of doing things. And, and because we're all sinful, all culture then becomes <laughs> sinful. And uh, that's sort of the question that Avagris was asking is what then prevents us from knowing uh, God. And the way to learn God to love God is to learn to love our neighbor. And that's probably the area that most of us struggle with. Um, and what we wanna do is to develop virtues that redirect the emotions and the passions to that which is good. So um, we repent from a life that is oriented against God to learn just how do we see ourselves within the broader perspective of God's love. So the nine deadly thoughts counter the nine deadly virtues or I mean, it's the counterpart to the nine virtues. And if we succumb to any one of the deadly thoughts, we create a roadblock that prevents us to make 
to really contemplate on God. So uh, the, the big thing here is I didn't like the word sins because sins referred to just sort of an act that is done. And I said that these are thoughts that are roadblocks to us learning. So that's uh, quite a bit different than just sort of sins. So we learn to love God by learning to love our neighbor. Uh, Jesus says, how can you love God? Uh, say you love God, but yet you, you, you cannot see when you uh, don't love those that you can see. So each of us are being assailed by these nine deadly thoughts uh, throughout our lives. So then the question I've been asking people uh, is just, how we'll react when the gravitational pull of each of these deadly thoughts arrives. And the way that it's sort of broken up is, uh, and I'll give you sort of the nine thoughts. The first one is just truth or a uh, lying. Uh, there's gluttony, there's lust, there's greed, anger, depression, indifference, envy, lying, and pride. What's kind of interesting about these is um, they cover areas of our lives. And I'll be talking about that a little bit uh, later here. But uh, when we're faced with these things, how do we deal with them? And of course, the, the positive side is temperance overcomes gluttony, chastity overcomes lust, generosity overcomes greed, meekness overcomes anger, and people go, what? <laughs> Wisdom overcomes depression, diligence overcomes indifference, truthfulness overcomes lying, um, happiness overcomes envy, and humility overcomes pride. It's kind of interesting, some of the things that uh, people have uh, looked at is like Billy Graham, Tony Campalo, uh, and some of the other writers of these seven uh, seven sins, you know, deadly sins is what they're called. And uh, they rank them according to the worst part, you know, the worst thing. And I find out that um, Evagra said, no, let's not deal with that. Uh, Pride, of course, is going to be the worst. Campalo says actually slothfulness is worse because you can't do anything when a person is slothful. Uh, they won't even start with anything. <clears throat> so he's got a point there. But the big part there is um, we want to build on success. So you start with the easiest ones and then you build on those type of things all the way up until you reach the sort of the hardest ones. So that's the process of reconstructing that Christian life. Great, great. So let me let me jump in with uh, an observation and then a, a question. So my observation is that, that this word virtue, it comes from the Latin word via, which means man. The, the idea in classical culture, this was carried on to medieval culture, that you know that someone is a man because they have these virtues. These virtues are good moral habits. This is me, uh, you know, coming from Thomas Aquinas. Uh, th this is nothing, nothing original, but like the virtue is, you know, if you're an honest person, you don't have to think, you don't have to struggle like, oh, should I tell a lie or should I tell the truth? If you have the virtue of honesty, you can tell the truth. Or if you have the virtue of humility, somebody, you know, calls you a name or insults you, you don't have to have that profound inner struggle through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit and the discipline of, of the human heart and the appetites. You just, you, you just know automatically how to say, well, let's, you know, let's just wait on that. Let's pray for that person. Maybe they're having a bad day. Um, what do I actually get by defending my, like, like these, these sorts of things. Um, so that's my first observation about virtue. It's a very profound word a very beautiful concept and something that I think is very foreign to a lot of uh, American culture today. And then my question for you as, as someone, you and I have both uh, done ministry and carried out ministry in a number of different cultural backgrounds. Do you think that there are particular virtues or lacks of virtue? I, I, I like that you don't use the word sin. Um, uh, 
the vices, that, that's the correct word, virtues and vices, mm -hmm. that there are particular <clears throat> vices that certain cultures tend towards? Or do you think it's just very much on an individual basis? I think that uh, well, various, every culture would have uh, sins, if you were, or vices in each one of these areas. What makes the difference is the cultural expression of it. So um, I have a friend of mine, he says, oh, you know, but yeah, we have this problem in our culture and yet, but I look at America, you do the same thing. And I go, yes, we do. However, it's, there is a unique expression to it, to each culture. So uh, yeah, we do have the same things and we struggle with the same things. It's, it's not a big deal, but we're looking at the unique expression of each one of these within the cultures that we, uh, the person is coming from. Uh, let me bring back a, sort of another sense of a, another layer to this. If we're going to have a, a community that functions well, there are three ingredients that you have to have. Uh, number one, you have to have a community of trust. Uh, second of all, you need to have a community of vulnerability. And third, you need to have a, a community of accountability. Where most of the people that are coming from uh, are coming from totalitarian governments, coming from heavy handed kind of things in which legitimacy for um, ruling the country is based on creating distrust within the community. So you have secret police, you have all kinds of ways of undercutting um, trust so that the people can't work against the government. So now when we're bringing them together, we're finding out that uh, in community, they don't trust one another. Sort of the default setting is lack of trust, trying to find out what the person actually is saying um, rather than what they are saying. <laughs> you know? So the whole indirect communication, what can I find out what's going on? And there's this lack of trust. So the we need to create a community of trust. And I, I find that the way that we do that is providing a safe place where in small groups, and you can't do it church-wide, but in small groups, you create a community of trust. And to do that, you have to address issues that are taboo in society. So, so I, I can totally identify with what you're saying. I'm not primarily like in Madrid, I'm an associate pastor at the Anglican Cathedral, so that's mostly Spanish language, some English, and also one of the pastors of Canisa, which is an Arabic language fellowship, it's a little group. Um, but I know that there are also a number of Iranian believers here. And one of my colleagues, a good friend of mine uh, with the Assemblies of God, he has a lot of friends among the Iranians and they're either seekers or, or Christians. And some of them have been Christians for many years. And he just gets frustrated because he's like, I try to get them together with each other and they just don't want to do it. But if I invite them to an event where it's just a bunch of Spaniards or Americans, or they're, they're like, oh, that's fine. But if I try to get the Iranians together, they just, they're, they get very worried and distrustful. So is, is that kind of what you're talking about in terms of trust? Am I thinking, am I understanding you correctly? Or is that- Oh, definitely. Thing? I mean, you took a look, take a look at Russia right now. They don't trust one another, you know. It's anybody could be an informant of of Putin and the you know the government. Uh, you go to China, it's the same thing, uh, undermining trust in sort of the way that everything is run within that country. So, one of the big things is to reestablish um, a sense of community. Uh, to reconstruct that Christian life, you're going to have to go back to this very basic element that you have to create a community of trust. And if you don't trust one another, you won't be vulnerable. And the way that we get vulnerability is to address in a safe place issues that are taboo that nobody talks about. 
And then of course, you won't be accountable to one another because you don't trust one another and you won't be vulnerable. So you can't have, be accountable to things that you won't talk about. Yeah, this, this uh, really relates to what we're doing with our tiny little Arabic fellowship here. We meet on Tuesday night. So for, for me, that was last night. And we had four people there in addition to the leaders. And it was a lady from Syria, from a Greek Orthodox background, I think. Uh, an older man from Egypt, from a Coptic Orthodox background, I think. A young guy from Algeria, who from a Muslim background and is not really sure where he is now. He's, he's not a Christian. And a young guy from Morocco, who is a convert from, from Islam to the Christian faith and, and, and has been following Christ for some years now. So, I mean, just a really weird, different group of people, but it was beautiful to see how they are beginning to trust each other and they are beginning to share their difficult, difficulties with each other. I felt like the time of work, musical worship and the time of biblical discussion, I, I, I felt like those were both very good, but I felt like what was most impacting was when they were sharing their prayer requests and one of the, one of the people had shared a pretty substantial prayer request last week and we prayed for that person and then something happened during the week that appeared to be a, a real very clear answer to prayer and that was shared and I felt like that was the most powerful time in that you know 70 minute worship service and, and, and I think it goes back to what you're talking about you know the word vulnerable comes from the Latin vulna, vulna which is a wound you know we, we have to place ourselves in a position where we are willing to be to be weak so the way that we do this um is uh going through each one of these vices and we look in the the scriptures both of the negative things in regards to these areas the positive things and then we have questions of digging deeper that get into the sort of the cultural ways of of uh, responding to those things so let me just go through sort of um the way that this is done uh i had taught this first and i went through eight sort of what Evagoras had was eight vices and eight and eight virtue, virtues. And I was told by uh, the head of a Pars Theological Center, uh, no, there's, you missed one of the biggest ones, which is truth and lying. <laughs> so I go, okay. Yeah, that, I mean, that was just a no brainer. Yeah, so um, we worked through those areas. And <clears throat> going into the other ones, I like the way that Evagoras puts it is uh, there is the what we call the animal vices or the irrational instinct type of uh, things. There are the emotional vices and then there are the rational vices of the will. So the first ones are gluttony, adultery and greed. Well, in one sense, OK, you can fast from a gluttony, you can fast in a sense for adultery no i'm not going to do this and as far as for greed no i'm not going to do these types of things um so they can be handled sort of that way but what do you do with anger how do you fast from anger or how do you fast from depression uh it, it goes into a different level and to be able to address these things, you have to be done, it has to be done in community. You can't do this individually. Uh, and that's where sort of American Christianity, Western Christianity thinks that, okay, you can just give them the information, they can do it themselves. And there's not this sense of, well, it has to be done within community. But uh, as you go into these deeper, uh, it definitely affects the, the whole thing.